Palantir stock has been the topic of many conversations as of late, and in today's video, we're going to look at its price actions, the recent developments, technicals, and my opinion on if you should be buying the stock. As the market is very volatile at the moment, we should be mindful about which positions to pick, as well as their individual timing and exposure. Before the video begins, if you would like to see more stock analysis videos like this one, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Over the past few days, the price action of Palantir has brought the stock to around $9.36 before stabilizing around $8.68. Palantir has had a decent beginning of the month so far, with some of its losses recovered and the tendencies still looking to be on the up and up. The recent few months have been challenging for the data analytics company, and even more so for the countless people who bought the stock near its peak level. The ongoing sell-off comes as a result of market retracement after the 2020 bullish run, as well as a reaction to the turbulent world events and the likely interest rate increases to control inflations around the world. As we continue to explore possibilities in the market, Palantir has always seemed like one of the most obvious choices to park some of the capital into, both because its dominance in the technical expertise and the solidity of its relationships with deep-pocketed clients. We know for sure that data analytics is going to be a key section of the future, and elements left to figure out include if Palantir is going to remain a key player in the sector and if the market is set for a prolonged deflationary period ahead of us. Personally, I think that the answer for both questions is yes. Now, with that being said, let's also take a look at the technicals of the stock. The trading volume of Palantir has recently been around 31 million shares versus an average volume of 40 million shares. Over the previous 52-week period, its price fluctuated between $6.44 and $29.29. .29. The trading volume is a metric that can tell you how many shares are being exchanging hands and whether there's a lot of activities and tendencies to trend up for the stock. It often gives you a first idea about the popularity of the stock. When we use it to compare with average volume, it can also tell us if the company is enjoying additional momentum to reverse its trend or to break through the current resistance levels. Even when the current volume is lower than the average, it's an interesting indication because it may signify that a trend reversal may occur soon. The market cap of Palantir is currently $18 billion versus the enterprise value of $26 billion. To put simply, the market cap is a fair market value of the company based on the current market sentiment, the company's reputation and other macroeconomic factors. On the other hand, the enterprise value is usually the cost the company has already paid for its assets after paying off all the debts. It's worth mentioning that one of the most significant assets for many growth companies may be the intangibles, meaning they're not items or stocks or equipments that a company can use now, but they're promises that the company can grow significantly in the future, such as pledges for major contracts, brilliant management, charismatic leaders, or schematics for groundbreaking products. For startups, much of their valuations is based on those intangibles, which may have been determined in more favorable market conditions. In concrete terms, this means that there can be a huge difference between the market cap and the enterprise value, giving a false impression to the market participants that the company is trading at a discount. It's only trading below its book value, but that doesn't mean that the company itself is necessarily undervalued. It's also possible that the company itself was overvalued in the first place and this has deflated itself ever since. As we compare the current price to the historical price fluctuations, the stock is 35% higher than the one month low, 35% higher than the 12 week low, and 35% higher than the 52 week low. On the options market, which often gives us a hint on the market sentiment about where the stock price is likely gonna head next, the implied volatility is 67% versus a historical volatility of 108%. The put call volume ratio is currently at 0.51. It is normal for many stocks to also tend to have a higher put option volume than what they deserve, as many institutional investors hedge their long positions by buying put options. The most recent volume of options traded has been 84,000 contracts a day, 
versus the 30-day average volume of 77,000. In terms of open interest, the most recent volume of open interest has been 3.2 million contracts versus the 30-day average of 3.3 million contracts. The option contract is a derivative from the underlying security which gives participants the possibility to have a right to either buy or sell a security at a predetermined strike price. Buying the contract would give you the right and selling the contract would give you premiums with the obligations to execute the contract's rights if the counterparty chooses to do so. It is often said that you can evaluate the likelihood of a scenario based on the opposite of what the current ratio is. If there's a lot of put options there, there may be possible uptrends on the move. If there's a lot of call options, then the reversal may also happen. The reasoning behind the theory is quite simple. Most options expire worthless. In terms of its shareholder structure, institutional shareholders own 33% of the outstanding shares. The biggest shareholders include Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street. It's relevant to understand the shareholder composition of a company because this helps us to determine if you should hold the stock long-term or trade the company short-term. If the stock is mainly held by retail traders, it may be a sign that the stock lacks the depth to justify long-term trust from shareholders. Typically, the consensus is that there should be between 25 to 30% of institutional participation so that the stock is perceived as a sound investment and not just a short-term trade. This is obviously subject to a lot of exceptions, as many great titles are also held by retail and not institutional investors, but that tends to be the exception and not the rule. Let's also take a look at the short interest present in the stock, which is the amount of positions aiming to profit if the share price falls lower. Sometimes when there are significant short interest in the total volume, it could be a sign that there's an organized shorting operation going on, such as what happened with GameStop and AMC. The current short interest is 6% of the total float and 46% of it happen outside of public exchanges. Usually, if the short interest is about 15% of the total volume, with a significant chunk of it coming out of the dark pools, this may suggest that there are institutional positions taken to short the stock, and there would be potentials for a short squeeze. My recommendation for Palantir is to continue building the position in the stock while keeping in mind that the allocation should be prepared for a relatively long bear cycle ahead of us and to expect the market to return a few years from now. I would recommend to commit in total 5-8% to of your portfolio in Palantir. I would also recommend to split that allocation in batches of 20% at a time so that you may purchase more in case of further retracements. Now, given the current market environment, I believe that the equity market is in a vast phase of correction, especially when it comes to tech and growth type equities. The financial market has been living and breathing thanks to the continuous creation of new capital with different waves of quantitative easings, which will have consequences on the price of assets as well as their yields. With the interest rates kept relatively low over the years and the increase of amount of capital in circulation, this will keep putting significant pressure on the profit that we can expect the investment products across the board. And this, by the way, is a reality that may shift in the years to come if the interest rate of core infrastructures within our globally financialized system increases. It's useful to remember that the market doesn't represent the real economy, and of course, the real economy doesn't always reflect in the stock performance, since the name of the game here is ultimately called supply and demand, which depends on a whole bunch of factors that go way beyond our own control. If we think about it, this is like saying, if your neighborhood house that is put up for sale is only allowing those who actually want to live inside to buy it, Versus if you allow every single type of buyer with different intent or reasons to buy or to sell it. So obviously, there will be a significant difference in the price of this asset for those two scenarios. The market currently works more like the second option. And assuming that it would only reflect the fundamentals of the underlying economy would correspond to the first option. There are a few elements that are considered to be the reasons. The first one is the significant increase of amount of money printed by the central banks around the world, which is then distributed to the banks, 
with the expectation that they will be loaned to businesses. Normally, that's a good thing, but with a lack of opportunities in the real economy, the significant portion of that money actually went back to the financial system to buy up the price of existing assets. Now that the QEs have been wrapping up or ended around the world, I think that this drive behind asset price may no longer be as relevant as it is right now for the future. It is now compensated by the arrival of capital from one region to another and from one sector to another even within the same jurisdiction. With the increase of tensions around the world, capital is always looking for a safe haven to park their money into, not just for a place to grow the nominal value, but with a currency that tends to keep its purchasing power as well. The third factor is the creation or the birth of artificial bubbles either maintained by the market trends built up over the years or out of necessity. Capital needs to find a place to stay. Some good examples of this would include the EV sector in the 2020 and the oil and gas securities when there are tensions around the world. Either way, when it comes to the price trends of the market, degree of uncertainty is a key drive behind the price fluctuations and that is likely going to increase as we go on from there. When company announce that they are going to enter or exit different markets, or that they will be trading on different platforms and exchanges, this can all have significant ramifications on the price of this asset. Some of the considerations to have when operating in this context include having a clear view of what is going on, especially regarding the cash flow and the capital flow, and avoid certain potential pitfalls. One of these is to be careful with short positions. Inherently, short positions are riskier than long positions as the downside of long positions is limited, whereas the short positions can lose you as much money as the stock price may reach, which is infinite. On top of that, we're now seeing a new phenomenon with short squeezes involving a group of retail traders propping the stock price up forcing short sellers to recover their positions. Sometimes the attempt will not succeed, but sometimes they end up in very spectacular success. Something else to consider is to treat tech stocks with care. To start ask questions when the price of a security skyrockets without real fundamentals. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be touching it with a 10-foot pole, but it does mean that there should be a difference between the decision of long-term holding and short-term trading. Either way, a rule of thumb is that each position should be structured in a way so that their individual performances will never affect the portfolio's stability. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.